uh, it's 1033, so we should probably get going here today because in the, in the nature of time. So just, you know, some housekeeping, please, if you've got a question, um, enter it on the Q&A. That would be great. Um, little comments and stuff we can just put on the chat. Thanks, Dion, for uh, advising no echo. I apologize, Frank, if there's a, if there's a way I could help you, I would, but I'm not that great at the uh, online tech support. But I, I know a lot of the time it can yeah. stem from a, a speaker issue. Um, so maybe try adjusting adjusting that. So uh, without further ado, um, we have today on, on our um, uh, participating as presenters, um, myself, uh, Aaron, Elvis, John, and Ryan will all be um, doing some teaching today. We've got a lot of different topics to go through. I think we'll take us uh, right till about 12 o'clock. And, uh, and that should give us some time at the end for some Q&A. And this whole thing will be recorded, just so you know, and we'll post it on the on our YouTube channel and our website later, so you can uh, review it if you need to. Um, our standard disclaimer, uh, just basically saying that we've done as much as we can to make sure that the information is accurate, and uh, the Luff Financial team, as you're well aware, has uh, continues to expand. Um, I think on our on our call today, we'll also have uh, Kadeem uh, there to answer some questions. But everybody, I think you should know the newer newer members of our team in the last year. Carmen Gill joined us as an associate investment advisor. Um, he uh, recently came to us from uh, a large banking institution, and we're very happy to have him. He recently wrote his level three CFA, so we uh, give him all the best. And you should be. Uh, have had interactions with our associate portfolio manager Vincent Zhang and and our associate investment advisor Kadeem and of course uh, who could forget our client service experts that really keep the ship going in the right direction Christina and Mari and uh, also joining the team in the last while has been Andrew Sutherland who does a lot to make our presentations look better and uh, development for the website and our videos so uh, and the advisors and portfolio managers you you know well um, you know, just a shout out to the nature of the team. We continue to be recognized by the industry as one of the top teams in Canada. Um, you know, a position we don't uh, take for granted in our, uh, in our constant goal to, to do well and do better for you as our most important uh, clients. And that's why we do these uh, webinars to try to keep you as informed as possible about the changes uh, we see happening in the world of the investment markets as well as financial planning. Um, just to remind you that uh, our back office, uh, IA Private Wealth, and our custodian where your uh, assets are all held is National Bank. So your assets are safe and secure and uh, all regulated by CIRO, the Canadian Investment Regulatory Organization. Uh, we continue to do a lot of teaching at the practice, not only directly to you, our clients, but to the City of Vancouver, the Vancouver Police Department, Vancouver Fire Department, and Metro Vancouver, uh, continually educating our clients. It's been a long process of that education. Uh, we continue to do so, and I think it's the best way to keep you informed. Um, our parent company, I Financial Group, that Luff Financial chooses to be a part of, is a large, secure organization with over $210 billion in assets, and really helps provide us the um, the custodian of those assets, things like the website, uh, the client portal, and uh, legal and compliance for you. So, without further ado, I'll pass the torch over to Elvis Picardo, our senior portfolio manager, who will be going through a look at what's in store for 2024. Uh, so, what's in store for 2024? Welcome to our 2024 uh, outlook presentation. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss some risks first, followed by expectations for this year, uh, rather than the other way around, so that we can finish on a positive note. I'm going to begin my presentation with a look at a slide from a seminar, uh, from a webinar exactly one, um, one year ago. So, this is a list of trends for 2023, according to Bloomberg. It was published in Jan of that year. Now, hidden among some of the obvious risks, like the debt ceiling and cyber attacks, 
is something that arguably had the biggest impact on the markets in 2023. And that something is chat GPT, the first artificial intelligence or AI program to make it into the mainstream. Now, depending on who you ask, AI either has the potential to unleash massive economic and social benefits or end the world as we know it. Moving on to the next slide. Here's a very interesting chart. AI could well be the new reality, and I'm going to demonstrate that with the chart, but as far as the hype is concerned, it really began in earnest on May 25th last year. Um, so what happened on that date? It was about six months after the November 2020 launch of Chad GPT. On May 25th, NVIDIA, the biggest maker of chips that are used in AI applications, came out with an absolutely stunning earnings report that showed that uh, demand for its chips was, you know, just off like a rocket. And that earnings report set off a stampede into AI related stocks. Um, as you can see from the green bar on that chart, uh, the stock surged 24% on that day on heavy volume. And coincidentally, NVIDIA reports fiscal Q4 earnings uh, today after market close. And that number could really set market direction for the next few days. In fact, uh, JP Morgan, with uh, I think just a little bit of exaggeration, uh, calls NVIDIA currently the most important stock on the planet. On to the next slide. Now, NVIDIA, sorry, I'm juggling multiple screens, so I might be uh, a little bit here and there. Uh, NVIDIA has replaced Netflix as part of the original FANG group. I used to detest that acronym, and the new one is not much better. So anyway, Facebook went, underwent a name change to Meta. Then you added Tesla in the mix. So you had this big group of seven of the biggest companies uh, in the US, pretty much in the world. And uh, the moniker for that is the Magnificent Seven. Now, if you look at the chart on the left, it shows you that uh, this group gained by an average of over 110% in 2023. So pretty much doubled in price, led by NVIDIA and Meta, uh, both of which actually almost tripled in price. Uh, but these seven stocks, if you look at the chart on the right, they fell by an average of 46% in 2022. So the takeaway here is, even though it may look like these stocks are crushing the market, this group of you know seven of the biggest stocks in the world is actually up only about 15% over the past two years. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Now, the reality is that you saw this rally coming. But let's back up for a minute. minute. I talked about the big change in, in the seven stocks, you know, down in 2022, up in 2023. Same thing with the S&P 500, down 19% in 2022, up 23% in 2023. Uh, guess what was the change in terms of, you know, the closing level for the S&P over those two years? It was 0.08% or just three points. Same situ situation with the NASDAQ composite, gained a stunning 43% in 2023 but it lost one third of its value in 2022. So net change over this two period of this two year period, minus 4%. Our much maligned TSX actually did better. Uh, it was down 9% in 2022, up 8% in 2023. So much more of a smooth ride. And it only gained one third as much as the S&P 500 last year, for sure. But also it was down much less, just over half of how much the S&P declined in 2022. Uh, so what are the takeaways from this slide? There's quite a few here. The first thing is that you cannot look at return numbers in isolation. They have to be viewed over a period of time. If you really want to get a sense of what your expected return is, uh, you know, looking at a two-year or three-year period, a select period, makes very little sense. You've got to look at it over an extended period of time. And especially in the last four years, when uh, when return expectations and actual returns have been all over the map because we've gone through a number of really big, uh, you know, once in a hundred year kind of events like the pandemic. The second takeaway is that reversion to the mean 
is a key feature of the markets. What this means is that if a stock or an index or the market, it may go up or down a lot in a given year, but over time, it will revert to its long-term average or mean. The third takeaway is that markets are inherently unpredictable. Think back to the situation a year ago. We had fears of an imminent recession. We had spiking bond yields. We had you know, rising interest rates, a simultaneous crash in stocks and bonds a year before. And guess what happened? Markets rallied. Um, but two years ago, COVID appeared to be in retreat. And consumer demand was surging. What happened next? Russia invaded Ukraine, inflation soared, and central banks raised interest rates at the fastest pace in four decades. So in 2022, despite things starting off on a good note, markets crashed. Now these risks continue to dominate the agenda. Uh, Sorry. Let me back up here a minute. In a, in a survey of uh, conducted by Citigroup earlier this way, earlier this year, geopolitics was rated as a top concern for 2023, followed by the US election and inflation or higher interest rates. So you know, you're seeing a continuation of the same risks, familiar risks. The truth of the matter is that the world does seem to have become a more dangerous place over the last couple of years, and markets are really undeterred at this point. But, you know, things could change. Uh, the market's really good at absorbing known risks, known events. It's not very good at uh, taking, you know, unexpected events in stride. As for example, during the pandemic, uh, you had the markets collapse like 30% in a matter of weeks, but then you had this really huge rally because of fiscal, monetary and fiscal stimulus that took us to new heights. Um, so just a quick note here that geopolitical, geopolitical risks do seem to matter, even though the market's not concerned about it at this point in time. We talked about the Magnificent Seven earlier, and here's a disconcerting trend. Uh, higher tech concentration for some reason seems to lead to higher geop geopolitical risk. Um, so you had the uh, Arab-Israel war in the 70s, um, followed by the oil embargo and inflation because oil prices pretty much tripled. Then in 2001, right after the dot-com implosion, you had 9-11. And you know, in recent years, we've had the Rus Russia-Ukraine uh, war and inflation, a number of shocks. Um, so that's on the risk side. There's one other risk that I'm going to talk about, and it's something you probably have already heard. It's something I've alluded to. It's called concentration risk. What concentration risk is, um, as the name implies, it means that the market advance is being driven by a very small group of stocks. So it's like the generals in an army, you know, as long as they are plowing forward, it's all good. But if something happens to them and you know they get taken down, then you're in full retreat. Um, so if you look at this slide from the beginning on the left-hand side, from the beginning of January 2023 to Jan 26th of this year, so approximately 13 months, the top 10 S&P 500 stocks accounted for 86% of the return generated by the S&P. So that was about 26%, let's call it. And 86% of that came from the top 10 stocks. The other 490 combined only contributed a total of 14%. Um, if you look at the charts on the, on the right, what they tell you is that this group of 10 stocks makes up one third of the index, the S&P 500, but it only contributes 20% of index earnings. And I'm going to discuss and um, define index earnings a little uh, further down the presentation. But the conclusion here, is that there are some absolute bargains in the remaining 490 stocks in the S&P 500. Now, we do have exposure to this Big Ten through a Platinum Growth Fund, but we hold a number of the remaining 490 directly in your portfolios. So, you know, top-notch companies like Salesforce, CVS, 
Disney, Johnson & Johnson, Medtronic, Visa, household names that are extremely strong companies. So that's it for the risk side. And like I promised, things are going to get better from here on. Um, firstly, it's not it's not all doom and gloom, right? Um, we had a lot of chaos. We had a lot of turbulence in the last four years. But we think 2024 will be more like a normal year, more of a normalized year. And here are a few reasons for optimism. The first thing is that uh, our Canadian economy it's literally on the edge of recession. It's skirting the edge of recession. But even if it tips into one, the forecast, the expectation is uh, that it may be a short recession. It may be a shallow recession, which means that it won't be a deep one. It will be like, you know, minus one up two percent in terms of uh, GDP growth. So not a really deep recession yet, like you'd see, um, like, for instance, that occurred briefly during the pandemic. In the US, it seems that very likely that they may actually achieve what's called a soft landing. That seems like the base case scenario at this point. The other point of note is that inflation is tread, trending steadily lower as demand normalizes after the post-COVID recovery. So this means that uh, we can look forward to multiple rate cuts in Canada and the US. And finally, and the, this is the most important point, despite all that's been going on, earnings growth um, remains strong. And that's very positive for the markets. Also on a positive note, the historical pre precedents look fairly promising. Um, so just judging by history, a strong January typically leads to annual gains for the S&P 500. Um, in January of this year, the S&P was up. I think one and one or one and a half percent, but even a small gain of that uh, magnitude historically bodes well for the rest of the year. The other point to note is that there's a second historical precedent that also looks promising. We've got the U.S. elections uh, in November of this year, and you've got uh, Joe Biden uh, in the race. So in years when there's a U.S. election and the current president participates in the election, the S&P 500 has gained by an average of 13%. So, you know, pretty promising number. And that's the slide right here. Let's look now at the economic outlook. So the IMF publishes, the International Monetary Fund publishes a very well uh, um, compiled and comprehensive economic outlook twice a year. So the one in January, they took up the expectations for the global economy by, by a little bit. They now expect the global economy to grow at a steady pace of uh, over 3% this year and next year. And combined with inflation that seems to be moderating on a global level, um, the forecast is for what's called a global soft landing. Um, you know, you've got kind of a really decent growth in, in North America, even though Europe and Japan are struggling a little bit, the expectation is that they will improve as the year unfolds. Um, as Canadians, you know, this is obviously of greater importance to us, um, what's going to happen in our economy. So the Bank of Canada expects the economy to improve gradually after being on the edge of recession uh, in the second half of 2023. And you can see that on the um, bottom right panel. From mid 2024, the Bank of Canada forecasts growth to pick up because it expects financial conditions to ease. What that means is, you know, with interest rates coming down, um, financial conditions get a little bit better, which again feeds into consumer confidence. It helps improve household spending. Um, as, a, as interest rate uh, rates, as bond yields stabilize, interest rates start coming down, you know, the global economy, economy improves. So foreign demand recovers. And for us, that's a very big part of the equation. Um, you combine that with inflation that's expected to continue decelerating, and the Bank of Canada expects GDP growth pretty anemic this year, 0.8%. But next year, it will be a different story, up to about 2.4%, almost 2.5%. So that's fairly positive. What about interest rates? Now, uh, you know, with all due respect to the uh, Bank of Canada, the, the interest rate or the central bank that's 
watched most closely in the world is uh, US Federal Reserve. And uh, as you can see from the chart here, uh, expectations are, so the Fed funds rate, the key rate, the benchmark rate that they call it, is currently at 5.38%. And the Fed has been on hold for the last two or three meetings, which has what has what, which is the main trigger for this uh, market rally we've seen since November. Now, Fed ex officials expect the rate to be at 4.6% by year end and 3.6% by end 2025. Um, but investors, you know, they never want to kind of wait for things to happen. They always want more than what the Fed's willing to give. So they expect rates to be even lower at about 4.16% by the end of this year and 3.38% by end 2025, which is the green diamonds in the chart there. Uh, the Fed has been pushing back against these rate expectations and the market expected rates to come down as early as uh, March of this year. But it looks like the Fed may not cut before June at the earliest at this point in time. So, you know, let's look now at the earnings outlook. Like I mentioned, um, this is the biggest driver of the market, corporate earnings. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a background here so you can understand uh, what we're talking about on this slide. So an index like our TSX Composite is made up of the biggest companies in Canada. So we've got 225 companies in the TSX Composite. And uh, each company has a weight uh, in the index that is proportional to its market value or market cap. So the biggest com Royal company, the biggest Canadian company uh, is Royal Bank. That has a 6% weight in the TSX. Next is TD Bank at 4.9%, Shopify at 4.4% and so on. Now, almost all of these companies are profitable. So for any company, um, the annual profit that it makes in a year divided by the number of shares it has is called earnings per share or EPS. In an index like the EPS, like the TSX, the EPS of all these companies is aggregated to come up with a single number called the index EPS. This index EPS grows in line with economic growth. So, you know, Single digit growth is usually usually the norm for uh, uh, for the EPS of an index. Double digit growth is less common. It occurs in a strong economy and negative growth occurs in a recession. So now if you look at the chart, um, last year our economy was practically in a recession and the an EPS for the TSX fell by about 9%. This year, growth is expected to pick up a little bit. So EPS is forecast to grow at nine at five percent, but next year, that's when you see a real change in uh, in um, in both in the growth side of the uh, nation and in the EPS uh, reflected, you know, through that growth. EPS growth next year, twenty twenty five, is, is expected to double to eleven uh, percent. The S and P five hundred is expected to do a little bit better because the U.S. economy currently is in better shape. It's expanding at a faster pace. Uh, but the point here is that the TSX is expect you know it's been lagging a little bit. It's expected to catch up. So this just gives you some numbers on the earnings outlook. Um, and let's uh, I, I want to make a point about the uh, about this particular slide. So we talked about uh, stock price and EPS. If you divide the price of a stock by its earnings per share or EPS, you get what's called the price to earnings ratio or the PE ratio. So a stock that's trading at 100 bucks as an, and has an EPS of five bucks and you know, it makes $5 per share in profit, it's got a PE of 20, 100 divided by five. You can also think of the PE ratio as a price you would pay for the stock for each dollar of earnings. So a stock like I don't know, NVIDIA, Amazon, you know, market darlings, people are willing to pony up a lot of dollars for those stocks. They, they trade at high PE ratios. Conversely, something like a utility stock that's got, you know, a, a low growth rate, it, it might go for a PE of 10 or 12. So just like for a stock, for an, for an index, the PE for an index is the index EPS that we just discussed um, in the denominator and the level of the stock in the numerator. So an index doesn't really have a price. It trades at a certain level, as you all know. So for the TSX, currently at about 21,200. Um, 
And if you look at this chart on the right hand side, you see the EPS number for December of or the EPS number for 2024. That's at about $1,484. So the PE for the TSX is 14.3. For the S&P 500, it's about 20.5. No, significantly higher. So what's the significance of this PE ratio? It's a core valuation measure, and it tells us whether a stock or index is cheap or expensive. The TSX generally trades at a lower PE than the S&P 500. It's always done, been, been that way, except maybe for a brief period in the uh, early 2000s when commodity prices were going through the roof. Uh, but the point is that this valuation gap is quite a big one, and it, it does appear, it does look like the TSX is cheaper, much cheaper than the S&P 500 on a relative basis and on a historical basis. Uh, on to the next slide. How do we bring this all together? OK, so one of our favorite fund managers would always use the example of a car on the highway to demonstrate um, portfolio principles. But personally, though, I prefer to think of one's portfolio as a boat on the ocean. And uh, full disclosure, my only uh, uh, experience with boating has been a little bit of uh, kayaking and canoeing, but just stick with me here. So you think of a portfolio as a boat on the ocean and the destination is your investment goal, whatever it is. And the travel time is measured in years and decades, you know, not months or weeks. Um, so why the ocean? It's much more in, unpredictable than the interstate. Sometimes you have sudden storms that are similar to a 10% correction. Uh, occasionally you have hurricanes like the uh, 08 financial crisis or the 2020 pandemic. Um, but the point is, it's very unlikely that you will get to a destination without encountering a few storms. So what would you do when there's a storm warning and the waves are getting bigger? The logical course of action would be to batten the hatches and reduce speed, right? Not go full tilt into the storm. Uh, we all know the story of the sinking of the Titanic, you know, one of the most famous shipwrecks in history. Uh, and that happened because it was traveling too fast in an area that was littered with icebergs. So in this example, reducing speed uh, in, in a boat would be like settling temporarily for a lo lower growth rate in your portfolio uh, with the intent of making up time that is higher returns later when the weather improves, when the uh, investing in when, uh, environment improves, rather than trying to go too fast in a storm and losing it all. So this is what might be mean by being defensive. We battened the hatches a little bit. Uh, we are currently a little bit underweight equities at about 59%. In a balanced growth portfolio, the range for equities is 55% to 65%. So we would take it down to 55% if things look really dire. We don't think that's the case. We would be up to 65% if things are looking really rosy. And that could happen in the next 12 to 18 months. But currently, we are right in the middle at about 59%. And within this equity sleeve, we have a really healthy mix of growth stocks and value stocks. So the growth stocks are the ones that we're all familiar with. You know, the big seven, uh, we've got a bunch, we've got a few of them in Canada too, things like maybe Shopify, but the Canadian index is chock full of value stocks and they are, they offer tremendous value at this point in time. Uh, when interest rates come down, value stocks in sectors like telecoms, utilities, financials do really well. And we own the best of breed in this, uh, in this group. You know, companies like TD Bank, Manulife, Fortis, Verizon, excellent companies. Now, let's talk returns for uh, for a minute. Um, actually, hold on. Let's stick to this slide here for a minute. So, a typical growth portfolio, uh, I should say balanced growth portfolio, or what's called 60-40. It contains 60% equities and 40% bonds. Now, in recent years, some of that bond allocation has gone to what's called also alternative funds. Um, so what is the balanced growth portfolio? What's it done over the last 10 years? So if you look at uh, such a portfolio, it's probably got like 30% Canadian equities, to keep it simple, 30% US, and 40% Canadian bonds, right? That's a makeup of most balanced growth portfolios, uh, just, just on a simple basis. So over the past 10 years, such a portfolio would have returned 
6.93%, not 12%, not 15%, 6.93, just under 7%. Since the year 2000, a balanced growth portfolio like this would have returned about 5%. These are the long-term returns you, ex you should expect. If an index like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, you know, goes crazy for a period of three or four years, delivers exceptionally high returns for a period of time, well, guess what? You're going to have reversion to the mean at some point. And what that implies is that future returns will be much less. It's a fundamental law of nature. Like they say, trees don't grow to the sky. There's a reason for it. Um, so right now, the Canadian market is very much out of favor. Is there a likelihood it might catch up in the next five years? Absolutely, there is. Uh, is there a possibility that it may even outperform the US over the next five to 10 years? Yes, it could, depending on circumstances. That's what happened in the first uh, 10 years of this decade. But for the last 15 years, the US, led by the tech sector, has been crushing it. It's not just Canada that's lagging. It's pretty much every market in the world that's trailing in the wake of the US market. But will the situation kind of revert to the mean over the next five to 10 years? It very well could. We also need to distinguish between income and growth. A balanced growth portfolio like a pension model will give you a combination of growth and income, but a pure income portfolio, which is what a Canadian dividend model is, it'll only de deliver income, which is like maybe 3%. You know, you're clipping coupons, you're getting dividend income, but you're going to get like three or 4% with very little growth. A balanced growth portfolio, on the other hand, could very well give you six or seven percent over a period of time. Uh, I want to make a point here about uh, bonds, especially. They look really attractive, and especially compared to GICs. So this chart shows you that uh, the return to risk ratio for bonds is very favorable right now. It's 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 really unusual. You seldom get this kind of kind of uh, you know return to reward risk to reward ratio for a thirty year U.S. Treasury bond, for example. Uh, if interest rates go down by 1%, you'd get something like a 20% capital gain. Now, this is excluding the interest that you get on that bond. It's just capital gains. If rates go up by 1%, that bond's going to fall down about 12%. So that's a risk reward to risk of almost 2 to 1. Very unusual. The bond, bond pools that we hold in a portfolio, which is the Majestic Global Income Fund and uh, the TD Fixed Income Pool, they've got a yield of over 5%. At this point in time, that yield might drop by a little bit over the next couple of years. But at this point in time, a very healthy yield of over 5%. But more importantly, the duration of these pools is about six to seven years. And what this means is if rates go down by 1%, your bond portfolio goes up 6% to 7%. So if rates go down, go down by 2% over the next, let's say, couple of years, uh, you'll get about a 14 to 15% appreciation on the bond part of a portfolio plus the 5% coupon. So that's like close to a double digit return, which is, it's a really, really good, um, good kind of situation for bonds right now. And it's one reason why you should, if, if you're thinking of going to GICs, I'd strongly suggest you consider a bond portfolio instead. Um, one of the things that we do um, you know, all the time here at Left Financial as portfolio, man portfolio managers, we uh, we are very proactive with your rebalancing. If you were to manage on your own, you kind of got to make the time to sit down and you know, trade on Quest Trade or whatever. Um, it's very difficult to do that on a timely basis. We watch the markets extremely closely. That's what Vincent and I do all the time. And we, re we rebalance your uh, portfolios on a very proactive basis. Um, and why is that important? It's, it's because so the best way to make money and to juice returns is by adding to a core positions when prices are low. So, for example, a platinum fund, the chart of which is out here on the uh, on the screen, uh, on the right. You know, it, it 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 struggled there for a while because growth stocks were out of favor in 2022. We kept buying to that position. We kept adding to it because we were convinced that it was going to recover in time. And and you know it's a very easy kind of trade. The, it's it, it contains some of the best fund managers in the world. It's got fifty percent exposure to the U.S., about thirty percent to Canada. Very very strong fund. Very proud of it. 
Uh, and we've been adding to most of our positions over the past two years at lower prices than its price today. It recently traded over 10 bucks, and I think over the next two or three years, as the markets recover, it'll do even better. Uh, the final couple of slides, and thank you for bearing with me. Um, just wanted to give you sense, some, some sense of what we do here at Luff Financial on the portfolio, portfolio management team. Um, you know, we've got a great team here at Luff Financial. Robert and I have combined experience of, of over 50 years in finance. And uh, for those of you who don't know me for our newer clients, I began my uh, finance uh, career trading currency futures in Hong Kong and then worked for two of the largest banks dealing in foreign exchange on the treasury side in India. Um, I've been in Canada for 30 years and I've worked as an analyst and strategist for uh, over 15 years in Vancouver before joining Robert. Um, so very proud of the team, you know, very happy to be a part of this team. And I think, uh, you know, we're doing, do, going to do extremely well in the next few years. So these are some of the things that we do uh, on the PMT side, you know, a bunch of different tasks. Um, and finally, I just want to highlight something from this particular slide. And that's your IPS your investment policy statement. It's a key document. Uh, and I would really urge you to spend some time going over it with your advisor. I find that often, uh, oftentimes clients get unduly worried about market risk and they settle for a more conservative portfolio than they should. Um, you know, like I mentioned, bonds look really good at this point in time, but over the long term, equities are the place to be. You can't really beat them because uh, the blue chip companies, the biggest companies, they've got enormous pricing power and can rest assured that in most cases, they will deliver um, returns to shareholders that are much better than the rate of inflation. So if, if you have a long-term horizon, if you're comfortable with the volatility with the markets, there's very little reason why you cannot have more of a growth-oriented model for part of your portfolio, like a TFS, TFSA, for example. You know, if it intend to keep your TFSA, keep growing it for the next five to 10 years to uh, achieve your investment objective of retirement or buying a home or whatever, then your TFSA is, it's a, your TFSA is a logical place to have a growth oriented model. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you very much indeed for your time. And I'll pass it over now to John. And I think uh, we're going to keep questions at the end. So sorry, not John, over to Ryan, I think. Take it away, Ryan. Thank you, Elvis. Um, <clears throat> that was that was fantastic. Um, so this, in this next uh, segment of the webinar here, uh, myself, John, and then Robert are going to go over some tax efficient accounts and tax in efficient investment vehicles that you can use to get the most out of your uh, savings. Uh, before you uh, set any goal or we give any recommendation, uh, we always want to make sure that you clearly define your goals um, and then we gather as much information as possible so we can give you the best solutions possible. And then we also want to review your goals, objectives periodically um, and it, at least annually to make sure that uh, the recommendations that we put in place are still uh, still relevant and still the best uh, best option for you and your families. So to start off here, I'm going to go through stage one, which is the accumulation stage. And I'm just going to give you a little snapshot of a 35-year-old couple uh, living in Vancouver that uh, has some goals. So this couple has $90,000 in savings sitting in a checking account. The wife's income is $120,000 and the husband's income is $55,000. So they have a net monthly cash flow. So that's after tax. They're bringing in $10,500. And the current rent is $3,000 and they have $5,000 in um, monthly expenses and they are able to save $2,500 per month after tax. So this couple has three goals. The three goals are to buy a condo with at least $100,000 down in 2025. They want to save tax efficiently for retirement and they also want to travel once a year and have a travel fund. 
So before we get started here, I just want to go over a few uh, different accounts that they this couple may use in order to achieve their goals um, quickly and uh, efficiently. So they, they're going to look at using the first time home savings account. Um, so the first time home savings account, you get a tax deduction in the year of contribution. You get a tax free withdrawal to purchase your first home and you don't have to repay that withdrawal. So there's the tax free savings account, no tax deduction for contributions. Investments grow tax free inside the account and there's no tax payable when you take that money out. Then there's the RRSP account, which you get a tax deduction on contributions. You get tax deferred growth, but you have to pay taxes on the withdrawal unless it's used for a home buyer's plan. So first time home purchase or lifelong learning plan. So let's address their first goal. So this couple, like as in the first slide there, they have $90,000 in their checking account. My first suggestion would be to have them transfer $35,000 to um, the wife's RRSP account to take advantage of the home buyer's plan and get a tax break. We put it in the wife's RRSP account so the wife would get the tax break. She makes $120,000 a year and has a much higher marginal tax rate than her husband. For both of them, we want to move $16,000 into their first time home savings account, which they'll get an additional tax break on that money. Um, and what that does is now instead of $90,000 in savings in their in their checking account, uh, they have a cumulative savings of $108,000 because they got $18,000 in tax refunds. So now they might be able to either pay for the property line transfer tax potentially or a portion of it and maybe even uh, um, get some furniture for their for their new home. So their major goal and their long term goal is the accumulation of money for retirement and they want to do this in the most tax efficient way. Now they have a, a few side goals and one of them is that they want to they want to be able to save and have the exact same amount of money in each spouse's name um, by retirement, but they also want to be tax efficient. And their goal is to have $7,000 per month in net income or net cash flow by the time they turn 60 and they're 35 today. So they have $2,500 a month that they can put away after tax in their budget. So their, their our recommendation to them would be to put $1,800 per month or $21,600 annually into RRSP accounts, taking advantage of the wife's high marginal tax rate. So how are they going to do this with equal savings? Well, what they would do is open up a regular RSP account for uh, the wife, and then the husband would open up a spousal RSP account in his name so that any contributions are getting a tax break at the um, wife, the higher income earners tax marginal tax rate. So they would have $10,800 each in annual savings into the RRSP and spousal RRSP. And then the remaining $700 per month, they would put aside into TFSA accounts. So $350 per spouse per month into TFSA accounts. Now, they've taken care of retirement. Now they need their vacation fund. So how are they going to fund this? Because they've been able to put away money in their RSP accounts and they're expecting to get a tax break on that money at the end of each year when they file their taxes, they're going to get an estimated $7,328 back in, in tax um, refund. And they can use that money to fund their annual, tr annual trip or, or travel fund. So just a little recap here of, of what that savings will look like from their TFSA accounts and, uh, and RRSP accounts by the time they hit uh, by the time they hit 60. So if we assume they're going to get roughly 5.5% in their TFSA accounts, their TFSA savings by the time they're 60 will equal just over $500,000. So that's they put aside 269,000 and they have 267,000 in growth. So they have just over 500,000 expected in their TFSA accounts to access tax free uh, throughout their retirement years. What about their RRSPs? So they've been saving over $21,000 per year into their RRSP accounts. And what does that look like over that the next 25 years? So by the time that they're 60, they should have roughly $1.3 million in their RSP accounts. So 
if you add up the $1.3 million in their RSP account, they're roughly 500,000 in their TFSA account, then that adds up to roughly $1.8 million. If you combine that with old age security, CPP and retirement, and maybe a work pension, they'll easily reach their goal of having $7,000 per month net in uh, retirement uh, income in today's dollars. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to John and he's gonna talk about how you can spend your money in retirement efficiently and the different vehicles that are available to you. Thank you, Ryan. Hopefully this goes smoothly. It's not always nice to have Ryan go right before me on computer stuff because Ryan and I have the same computer savvy. <laughs> can everyone see me okay? Did I transition that okay? Uh, you can see the slides, you can see me. Things, I'll assume, I guess no one can really talk to me, so I'll assume that went smoothly. Thank, oh, thanks, Elvis. I appreciate that. And thanks again, Ryan, for telling us, uh, showing us some good strategies as to how to save in a tax-efficient manner for all sorts of goals. Um, it's my job now to come in and talk to you about the decumulation stage uh, of the investment um, process. And by that, I just basically mean I'm here to tell you how to spend your money and when to spend your money. And so the first thing I want to tell you, though, is if you do spend the vast majority of your life, some would argue the prime years, saving all this money for, for all the goals throughout life, including retirement, the first thing you need to know is that it's a bit of a psychological shift once you get to retirement. You've been told to save, 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 and then you get to a certain point point. you're being told now to spend. That feels a little different. But when you do get to this stage and you're like, okay, now it's time to turn the spigot on, so to speak, and take some income, you got to ask yourself four questions. One, how much income do I need? Two, where is this income going to come from? Three, when do I need the income? And four, how long will I need the income for? So let's talk about the first one. How much income do I need? Now, when I hear people talk about retirement, I don't know why, maybe I've watched too many movies through the 80s, but I always imagine there's somebody at home with a calendar hanging on the wall and a circled date in the future that they are working towards. And every day they X out another day, another day, another day, I'm getting closer. I would argue that person already knows either what they need in retirement income or they just don't care. They're getting to that day and they're retiring and that's that. The rest of us though, if we're not really sure how much we're gonna need in retirement, we always like to run through what we call a lifestyle calculation. And I'm sure if you've sat across the desk from us, you've probably seen this in some iteration over the years. So what is a lifestyle calculation? Well, it's going to tell us what we're currently funding our lifestyle with. And I would argue that if you get to retirement, the goal should be at least to, to maintain your lifestyle, not take a hit on that kind of stuff. So how do we calculate this? Well, if you get paid once a month, it's quite easy. You just take the net pay that shows up every month. You get paid twice a month, you just take the net pay that shows up every time you get paid and times it by two. And if you get paid bi-weekly, you're going to take the amount that shows up in your bank account after every paycheck, multiply it by the 26 bi-weekly pay periods in the year, and divide it back into 12 months to give you a monthly average. And the reason we like to put everything into monthly terms is because that's how often all of your, generally all of your pension checks show up. So we want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So we put some numbers into this slide just to show a little bit of an example as to what I'm talking about. And in this example, we have a couple that are getting paid bi-weekly and they're getting uh, as a household every two weeks about $3,700 net of all deductions, tax, Canada pension contributions, perhaps regular pension contributions, union dues, that kind of stuff. $3,700 every paycheck lands in that couple's account. So we take that number, we multiply it by the 26 bi-weekly pay periods, and then we divide it back into 12 months to give us approximately $8,000 a month in net income. Now, the next thing we got to do is take off the debts, right? So in this example, this couple has a $750 a month mortgage. So in other words, this couple lives in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and I'm from there, so I can throw it under the bus. There's also $250 a month going into their tax-free savings account. So they're saving for something else. Probably listen to Ryan's advice, and, and we're trying to save for something. But what it tells us is that of the $8,000 that shows up, thousand of it is either going to service debt or to save for some other goal, whether it be retirement or a major purchase or whatever that is. Point being, it's not being spent on your lifestyle right now. What's left is your lifestyle. So 8,000 subtract $1,000 of debt and savings, and you're left with $7,000 a month to spend on everything else. So just know when we think or when we uh, allude to lifestyle, we're talking about food bills, 
uh, cell phone bills, car insurance, gas, as well as vacations and hobbies and quite literally everything else. But these are expenses that don't disappear when you retire, whereas a mortgage can be paid off and you can certainly stop saving when you get to a certain point. So in this example, we've done a calculation. This couple needs about $7,000 a month net. So what does that mean? Well, we got to the first thing we got to do is how much do we need? We need 7,000 net, but we have to account for tax. Why? Because things like pensions, whether it be your own uh, employer sponsored pension plan or Canada pension plan or old age security, or even money that you withdraw from your RSP or RIF, these are all taxable sources of income. So we have to account for the fact that the CRA is going to come in and get some tax revenue from this. So in this example, we're looking as a couple, they both in roughly the 28% marginal tax bracket. In other words, they earn another dollar and they're going to lose 28% of that dollar to tax. And that's about a 14% average tax rate. In other words, every dollar they've earned on average is losing about 14 cents to tax. And if we do that math, we look up at the gross income we're going to need, and it's going to be about $9,200 a month. That's what we're going to need before tax in order to hit our lifestyle retirement goal. Next question we got to ask is, okay, great, John, where is this all going to come from, though? And I would argue the first layer is going to be the pension layer that applies to all Canadians, and that's both Canada Pension Plan and Old Age Security Pension. So Canada Pension Plan, these numbers can vary, depends on when you take it, how much you've contributed it over the years. Old Age Security is simply based on residency. How many years in Canada did you live uh, in the 40 years prior to age 65 when you're eligible for your Old Age Security? So you might find these numbers differ slightly for everybody. But by and large, this is going to form the first layer of guaranteed income for you in retirement. The second layer is if you are a member of an employer-sponsored pension plan, you can look to that, whether that's a defined benefit pension plan, like the Municipal Pension Plan of British Columbia, or a defined contribution plan, where your employer and yourself are just contributing money into an investment uh, that you will soon tap into in retirement. And then, of course, the third option or the third uh, bucket that you can draw money from will be everything else, everything that you have specifically done, whether that be RSPs, tax-free savings accounts, or non-registered investments. That's where the money's going to come from. The next question is, when do I need it to come from all these sources? And that's why we like to look at this chart, which silos your retirement really into three categories. For those who are planning on retiring before 60, you just need to know that you're not eligible for your Canada pension or your old age security at that point. So you may be a member of a pension plan, which you can turn that income tap on at 55 or anywhere, sorry, between 55 and 60. But beyond that, it's really up to you, your RSPs, your tax-free savings accounts, or your non-registered uh, investments to make up the difference. So anyone retiring before 60 may lean on their portfolio a little more than someone who, say, retires at 60. Because at 60, you can take your Canada pension plan. You may still also be, be eligible for your pension. But now you're saying, well, now I may have a pension. I have Canada pension. I don't need as much from my portfolio in this uh, siloed period of my retirement because I do have other income from other sources. If someone waits till 65 to retire, again, they may have their own pension plan. They definitely will have Canada pension at that point, and they'll definitely have old age security at that point, saying that, OK, I need even less from my portfolio in those years because I have more guaranteed income coming from all these other sources. So when you retire has a great impact on when you when and how much income you'll need from your investment buckets. And how long will my income last? Well, this is there's a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a conversation surrounding this. You may find some individuals say, I want to blow through all of my portfolio by age 80, 85, 90, something like that. Fine. If that's the goal, do it. That's a different conversation. But if somebody says, I want to take a realistic withdrawal rate from my portfolio, and I kind of don't ever really want to run out of money. That makes me nervous. Again, the psychological shift of spending money in retirement. Well, let's look at what that might look like. In this example, on this graph, we have an individual, or perhaps a couple still, with $500,000 in their RSP or RIF. And they're making an average annual rate of return of about 5%, and they're also taking money out on average about 5% a year. Now, I've indexed this to inflation at 3% because I don't know if you've heard, but inflation has been a little nasty over the last couple of years. And so I'm kind of bracing for maybe a worst case scenario. But what does that mean when we say we index this to, at, uh, to inflation at 3%? What it means is $25,000 in income today or this year, you probably need a bit more next year in order to keep up with inflation, an increase of about 3%. That's what we're really talking about there. So in this example, how long will the RIF last if we start taking the income at age 65? 
it lasts until about age 90. It's 25 years of income. It's not bad. And that's indexed to inflation. But again, if someone raises their hand and say, this still makes me nervous, like what happens if I live till 120? Well, then we can adjust our expectations on the withdrawal rate. So the exact same example, what happens if we took the withdrawal rate from 5% down to 4%? In other words, we take out 20,000 a year index to inflation, not $25,000 a year index to inflation. Money essentially doesn't run out. So these are things to consider when you start thinking, I have my portfolio, I need to know how long I'm going to need it for and in what increments. And once I know that, I have to set a realistic expectation as to how much I can take from my portfolio if I don't want to run out of money. And another way to not run out of money too fast is to really take money out or, or um, explore the decumulation stage with some tax efficiency. And this is where Robert is going to come in and fill in these gaps for us. So I've raised the bar now, Robert. Can I pass the baton <laughs> off? Hey, look, he came back quite easy. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Okay, so um, we've uh, we've talked about a lot today. I kind of want to start to bring some of these things um, together a little bit more. And and one of the most common questions that we tend to get in the accumulation or decumulation phase when people are starting to build their financial plan is um, how, how do I how do I bring this all together? What do all these buckets mean? Um, so some of the questions that we get on a regular basis um, when we're trying to create strategies for turning on the taps on the various buckets, how do I make sure that my income uh, is below any clawback levels so that I can receive my old age security? How do I start to think of generating income from my investments? What are, the, what are these portfolios for? What will they mean as a pension to me? Um, how do I make sure that I'm not paying too much tax uh, I don't want that income to vary much over time, and I want to use it to supplement any government or private pensions that I have. This is what goes into creating the financial plan. I always say that these are the these are the questions that will drive your investment decisions. If you're making investment decisions to generate a hypothetical return as opposed to generate your actual income for a goal, you're missing the boat. So this is what you should be working on with your advisor directly to build that financial plan that will drive your invest uh, investment decision. So let me give you an example that we can actually go through. Um, let's assume you're 65 years of age as a couple. And now the couple both took CPP at 60. So their CPP was reduced, but they wanted to get the money when they could spend it. So they've got 12,000 of CPP each and they didn't qualify obviously to take old age security till age 65. So that's 85, 66 each. One of the couple has a pension plan that pays them $80,000 a year and their income splitting that. They've managed to uh, do very well for themselves. They paid off their home. Uh, they've got uh, an RSP with about half a million between the two of them. They've each maxed out their tax-free savings accounts and they're invested. They've also accumulated another $250,000 outside of their registered plans. And they've got a savings account, uh, cash with a GIC. So obviously the couple's done well, but this is a typical household that we will see and work with. A million dollars of investable assets, no debt. Maybe they have a pension plan, maybe they don't, but they're both qualifying for CPP and OIS. This would be a goal for your accumulation, and this would be a couple that would come to me and say, okay, what do, what do I do now? I need to get some money from these portfolios. Maybe they've just been getting investment advice and there's no idea of what level of income they can get. How do I make sure that I spend the money when I'm healthy? Um, very few people will want to continuously stay in the accumulation stage after they retire. You want to spend the money and enjoy the money. And I don't want to pay a ton of tax. I've paid enough tax as I go. So let's look at some strategies here. So um, we've got our CPP and OAS, we know. We've got our pension that's being income split. So their they're taxable income is 60 grand each. The tax payable on that, as you realize here, is actually pretty low. This is the early part of that middle tax bracket. So after tax, the family's taking home over $8,700 a month. 
uh, and no debt. So that's good. So their average tax, the total tax divided by their income is only 13.7%. Marginal is what we're concerned about. And think of marginal just like how it sounds. How much tax are they paying on the margin? The next dollar this couple brings in of other income, they're going to pay 28.2% tax. So how should we get this money out? You could tell yourself all day long that you want a balanced portfolio for your RSP, but what does a $500,000 RSP mean to you as a pension? What, how much can I take and when should I draw my TFSAs? What about this investment portfolio that's got 250 grand in and the cash account with the GICs? So let's break it down. Where possible during the retirement and distribution phase, you want to try to keep your income for each person below 91,000. Now, obviously, if you've done extremely well for yourself, um, this might not be possible and you're going to give back some of your old age security. But just know that every dollar you generate over 91,000, it's recovered, essentially taxed, but they call it OAS recovery at 15 cents for every dollar. So their income is 60,000 each, so they've got room of over 31,000 each that they can add without going into clawback. But as soon as their income goes over 91 grand, they're going to give pay tax at their regular marginal rate plus an additional 15 cents of OAS clawback. So the goal would be to try to keep each person, if we could, and if it made sense, under 91,000. Um, so let's start to think about generating some income from these investments. Our marginal rate is 28%. So we've got this RSP. John just showed you a couple slides on, on the RSP and ways to think about it. I would urge you to think of your RSP as uh, the last nickel comes out of the last spouse's hand as you're looking up at the lights in the gurney. Why? Because if you die with a $500,000 RSP at the death of the second spouse, it's completely taxed as income and you'll pay half of it to the tax man. So you want to drain your RSPs during your retirement life. Doesn't mean you have to spend the money, but we need to get the money out of that bucket. So we convert it to a RIF when this couple retires. They're going to take out 5% of it, $25,000 a year. They're going to index it to inflation. They're going to split that income 50-50 because at 65, they can split all income coming from their RSP. Do not wait till you're 71 to create a RIF. That's just bad planning, and we would not advise that for most people unless you're still working. You pay tax at 28% because it's taxed as income. So they're going to take home, this is the important number, not the 25 grand, but they're going to take home 1500 a month. So think about this, half a million dollar RSP and that middle tax bracket equates to an after-tax pension of about 1500 a month, pre-tax pension of just over two grand a month. So now their tax payable or total taxable income is 73 grand, but they've still got two, three other buckets to think about, the TFSA and this investment account and the hundred grand that they've got in savings. So we're already up though to 73,000 taxable. So what's next? Well, in this middle tax bracket, as you can see, it's a big one. Um, other income, you pay 28% tax. Rent, salary, interest. So think about that. A third of that money that you generate in that middle tax bracket is going to the tax man. Capital gains is only 14%, but these dividends over here, so profits being paid out of a Canadian company, 1.6%. So I probably want to try to get some taxable income over there. So Remember, the couple's at 73 grand now from their pension, CPP, OAS, and their RIF, paying only $12,000 in tax. Now we're bringing over 10 grand home a month for the family. We've already got a strategy now. We know what this $500,000 RSP means. What about the tax-free savings account? I like to think of the tax-free savings account as like, um, you know, a field of olive trees that you've planted. And you want those olive trees over time. You've nurtured them. You've hired me as you know the olive keeper to look after your olives we've done a great job as a team and now all of a sudden you start to get fruit well you're not going to pick all the fruit take out all the pits and keep planting more olive trees you're going to start to harvest some of these and hopefully you're going to enjoy them so what i'd suggest for a lot of these pe people in this when you get to retirement every year that you have money in your tax-free savings account take the gains out tax-free so if i make five percent uh, in your growth or balanced growth portfolio, withdraw that money at the end of every year as your Christmas bonus. Okay, this means it's tax free, 12 grand, 5% of 250 grand. Now you've got a strategy. 
we're going to make you unhappy about 25% of the time. And that's just statistical market odds of not making money in a balanced growth portfolio. You're going to not make money about 25% of the time. That means 75% of the time you'll be happy. So now we've got a strategy for our RSP and we've got a strategy for the tax free savings account. What about the non registered portfolio? So the non registered portfolio has $250,000 in it. Remember, the RIF is giving you. 18,000 after tax, 1500 a month. We're getting 12,000 after tax from the TFSA, even though it's half the amount because we're not paying tax. We want to start to think about this 250,000. The cash account that you've got right now, you've got it sitting in a GIC at 4%. So you're making four grand a year, but you have to give $1,148, 30% of whatever you generate on the GIC in back to the tax man. So you get the slip at the end of the year and you'll have to remit that $1,148. So you have to think about GICs and cash as the after tax return, right? So what are we gonna do then with this non-registered portfolio? Well, we don't wanna pay more tax. So how do we get tax efficient? So you think about this tax taxable portfolio. That's really what non-registered means. It's not in an RSP or a TFSA. You pay taxes, you go. And remember, interest I'm going to pay 28% tax, capital gains only 14%, and dividends 1.6. Now, I know I can get 5%, say, on my GIC. So I could make 12500 on this 250 but I net 8,900 and I have no chance to make more money. And as interest rates come down, which they will, this net number is going to go down. Your long-term after-tax real rate of return on cash is always negative. Your long-term after-tax real rate of return, so net of inflation on cash, is always negative. If you could always make a positive inflation-adjusted return on cash, there'd be no such thing as capitalism. Okay, You keep cash around. This couple would want to keep the 100 grand for money that they might want to spend in 2024, 2025, 2026. But if they don't need that money in the next three years, they should invest it in a more tax efficient manner to beat inflation. So we want to try to get for this couple some more income in the capital gains and eligible dividend line. Okay, so this is where our dividend portfolio comes into bear. A lot of you will own this portfolio non-registered. Think of it as an income primary purpose portfolio. It isn't necessarily just for growth. It will still have 60% stocks, but the prevalence of those stocks will be towards income generation, not just capital gains. If you want a more growth oriented portfolio, that would be our pension portfolio, our pursuit portfolio, or our perpetual portfolio. So portfolios that have more equity or more equity that's growth oriented. The dividend portfolio is if you're saying to yourself, look, that 250 grand, I want to generate a fairly stable tax efficient income. I'm not trying to hit home runs. I just don't want to strike out. So the investment policy for you is going to be between 55 and 65 percent stocks with income oriented investments being 35 to 45. But the stocks we're going to hold there are also can be geared towards generating income. We're going to try to generate as many dividends as possible and have capital gains over the longer term. But the fixed income component is going to be tax efficient as well. I'm going to get to this, but remember, we said normally interest income, you pay 28% tax. So how do I get tax efficient interest income? Well, this is a, a secret that we're going to show you here. The bond component of our dividend portfolio is the Canoe Bond Advantage Portfolio class. Now, I have a significant portion of my fixed income that I personally hold in my non-registered in this fund. So I eat what I cook. It's an actively managed core North American investment grade bond portfolio. It means this can be a big part of your fixed income, the bonds, the brakes on the car. It invests in high quality corporate bonds for income, longer duration, so bonds with a longer maturity for the insurance, and government bonds for safety and liquidity. This is considered a low risk investment. It's actively managed by Canoe's bond team who have experienced and proven bottom up credit processes. But the most important thing that we like about this bond portfolio is its tax efficient structure. So let me get into that. The majority of the income you'll receive is considered a return of capital. 
They will use the interest income to pay the expenses within the bond portfolio and essentially return your own capital to you. This reduces your adjusted cost base, meaning when eventually the investments in the bonds are sold, you get a capital gain. So let me walk you through this. If I can get a GIC with 5%, 4.9%, the canoe bond portfolio income yields about 3.3. But for a high in, in, income tax payer, after tax, if they're in a highest tax bracket, those GICs are only going to net them 2.28. The bond portfolio is going to net them 2.4. So that's the same as making a 5.2% equivalent yield. It offers a higher yield than the average one year GIC. It's still invested in a low risk investment. It can be cashed out every day. The GICs cannot, and it will diversify your portfolio when markets are volatile. GICs don't provide any negative correlation to risk assets. It's cash. So here's the thing I want to go through. It's that distribution. Um, why do we want these bonds? Because we get the diversification when the stock markets are volatile. It's going to be 20 to 23% of your portfolio if you're a balanced and growth investor, but it's this tax efficient return of capital. That distribution reduces your cost base on the investment. So when we sell those bonds for you, instead of getting interest income, like you're getting from the GICs, you get to put it on the capital gains line. So it's taxed at half the rate of normal interest income. And in periods of high market stress, like 2012, COVID, for example, when the stock market dropped 37%, Bonds are generally going to hold up quite well. As Elvis pointed out, if we expect interest rates to fall, bonds could actually increase in price so you may make additional capital gains. So this non-registered portfolio in our dividend portfolio, the current yield is 3%, but there is also potential for growth because 60% of the portfolio is in stocks. So you're getting paid to wait as a patient investor in a lower volatility portfolio. It's gonna generate, this is the actual example on 250 in our dividend portfolio, about $960 of interest income, but $1,400 in capital gains, 4,400 in eligible dividends. So it's an after-tax yield of 6,700 for this couple. Now, a three-year locked-in GIC is gonna generate them right now about 3%, but has no potential to grow. The dividend portfolio can grow because 60% of it's in stocks. So think about it this way. You're getting the same income equivalent or very close to the same, not locked in, better diversification, liquid, and potential to gain over the long term because you still got stock exposure. And with that, I will hand it over to Aaron. Thank you, Robert. Um, <clears throat> we're almost done here. I get the, the pleasure of uh, closing out the presentation today and talking to you about all the fun stuff regarding uh, tax slips. But I do get to provide you with a little tips along the way to hopefully make this uh, uh, very informative for you. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's our favorite time of year where after the holidays, uh, we start thinking about our taxes and, and the government wants to let us know that we all owe the money. It's called taxes. Well, being Canadian, we're all happy to pay our share and uh, we're more than happy to submit that. If you just let us know how much uh, we owe you CRA, I'd be happy to pay that. And they're like, no, I want you to figure it out. But you're like, well, I'm, I'm not an accountant. Um, do I just kind of pay what I think I owe? And you know, that's going to be okay. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We know exactly how much you owe. We just want you to figure it out um, so that you can pay us the right amount. And we know that you're being honest about it. Well, what, what if I get it wrong? You go to jail. That's kind of how that this whole process goes, which can create a lot of stress. You know, we have a lot of taxes in Canada. Now we're filing not just our income taxes, if you have property transfer tax, you have empty homes tax, you have speculation tax, you have your PST, your GST, um, just to name liquor tax, just to name a few. So trying to keep track of all these is no easy task. So hopefully today I can walk you through, um, you know, uh, some slides in a presentation to make this as easy as possible. And, you know, as Robert's talking about eating his own cooking, this is how I do my taxes and get them done with my accountant. So here we go. Let's let's get into it. 
Um, <clears throat> so one of the first things I just want to highlight is that we do provide a lot of resources on our website, uh, lovefinancial.ca. Uh, I would encourage you to visit that, not just for tax time. There's other resources there as well. Uh, but during tax time, and you know, we'll have it up all the time, we do have a, uh, a link that you can click, and it'll give you a bunch of information about what I'm talking to you about today um, in terms of when you're getting your slips and whatnot, all kinds of information, kind of a uh, frequently asked questions and answers on our webpage there. So please visit the webpage. Um, additionally, before we kind of get into all the, uh, before I get into the presentation, I want to let you know that um, you cannot update any of your personal settings in terms of getting things mailed to you or digital at this time of year as everything's already in motion. So you cannot change your mailing uh, status to, you know, not get paper and get them digitally. But that should be fine. Um, but going forward for next year after this, the tax time, you can update it so that maybe everything comes digitally only digitally okay so this is just kind of what our website looks like for uh you know for visiting on uh, to getting some of that information so please click into our website client resources here at the top tax time and there's all our questions so please visit that when you uh when you have a chance so what to expect this tax season you know which tax slips should i expect where do i find them uh how will i receive them and some tax filing recommendations, you know, how I like to get my taxes done. So what tax slips can I expect? Now, depending on what type of portfolio you have, registered versus non-registered, that all makes a big difference on what you're gonna receive in tax slips. I'm gonna start with your registered accounts. So RSPs, TFSAs, the new FHSAs, uh, RIF accounts, you know, locked in RSPs, locked in, um, you know, list, list locked in income funds. Uh, they all mail out the slips at different times. So con we'll start with the contribution slips for RSPs, putting money into your RSP account. You put money in potentially every two weeks or every month throughout the whole year. You'll start getting slips in January for deposits made between March and December 31st. That covers the, you know, the previous 10 months of the year. Now, additionally, you can make contributions for your 2023 taxes in January and February. Those slips will continue to be mailed out every two weeks, depending on your contributions. Obviously, you can make a contribution right up to the end of February this year. And then the slip will get mailed out after that. So the latest your contribution slips can be mailed out would be March 15th, which is why one of our big headlines of what not to do with your taxes is do not file too early. I appreciate being eager and on top of it and organized and wanting to get your taxes done, but do not file before April 15th, and I will hammer this, this point home many times. And one of the reasons is your contribution slips may not arrive in time. Um, for income slips, so that's your RSPs when you're putting money in. Now, when you're taking money out of your account, say your RIF account, um, you are going to get a, uh, a T-slip as well. Now, those slips will be mailed by, uh, you know, at the latest by March 1st. So you should be receiving those in March. Um, first home savings accounts. This is a brand new account, does not apply to a lot of people. But again, it's a contribution receipt. These deposits are based on annual year. So you cannot be making deposits now for 2023 um, in the FHSA. So those slips are going to be mailed out March 1st. Um, TFSA, sometimes they get questions. Oh, I think I have all my slips, but I don't have anything for my TFSA. I know I made a withdrawal or a deposit. Well, tax-free savings account, one of the biggest um, you know, pluses of these accounts is that there are no taxes to pay, so there is no reporting. So you don't get a contribution receipt when you put money into it because you don't get a deduction or anything like that. And you don't get a, uh, a slip for when you take money out because you're not paying tax on that income as well. Now, the deposits and withdrawals are being tracked for your room, but that's not a um, taxable or, you know, reported on your, on your income tax. So that kind of summarizes the registered accounts. Um, now, when it comes to non-registered accounts, that's when you can be getting a lot more tax slips and things get a little more complicated. So the non-registered slips, when it comes to T5s and T5008s, those, can be, those will be sent out by March 1st at the latest. But there are also T3 slips that are sent out for trust income that can be sent out as late as March 31st. Now, 
we all agree, and I don't know why it's like this, but you know, we need some updating to CRA and filing deadlines and whatnot. That puts a lot of pressure on the timing to get your taxes done if you're not even being mailed the slip until March 31st. So you may not be receiving this slip until, you know, depending on Canada Post, if it's in the mail until the first week of April, maybe even later, maybe the second week of April. Um, you know, that puts pressure on you, pressure on your accountant, um, but that's just the way it is. So the latest date that they that these slips can be mailed is March 31st. So that is why we say do not file your taxes before April 15th. You want to give yourself enough time for those slips to be uploaded to CRA and or that you've received them uh, in the mail. So you can get everything ready. You can start sending your account all the information going, well, I just want to make sure I have everything. Please do not file before, you know, April 15th. Um, your realized gain loss report, your foreign property report, annual fee letter, your investment income and trading summary, those should all be mailed by March 1st. So again, you'd be getting slips from potentially, you know, through January and February and March, but regardless of when you get all these other slips, you still don't want to be filing until later in April because the last slip, and it only matters on the last one, can still be sent out at the end of March. So that's why we say do not file too early. This is just if you never, if you're new to having non-registered accounts, this is an example of a T5 uh, slip that you would be receiving with all the different boxes and information that you need to follow your returns. Now, again, I'm, I'm going to give you kind of, I'm providing all the information, but I'm just going to give you the answers to this test of how you do this and in the, in the best and easiest and simplest way at the, at the end here. And part of that is where do I find my slips? So there's all different places you can get them. You can get them online. So if you log into our portal or on our mobile app, you'll be able to find all of your tax slips there, as well as your, you know, your monthly statements, your year end tax report. All of that is available on the portal online. So if you're not set up with the app or on the portal, I would strongly encourage you to um, to, to to set one set that up and log in to view everything. You can also, I would also strongly encourage you to set up my CRA account. This is very useful for accessing any of your tax information, whether it's previous returns, your notice of assessment, RSP, TFSA room, as well as accessing all of your tax slips or T-slips. Um, CRA knows what you owe in tax and what you made. Everything's been reported to them. So what you're getting, they have a record of that as well. So that would be the number one place I would go to access all of these slips because they will have a record of it. And additionally, you will be getting, if your preference is to get things in the mail physically, you will be getting them mailed out as well. Now, if you're getting them mailed, they will still be available online on our portal and on the app. So if you want to access our portal or the app, uh, where you go to is the IA Private Wealth website, you know, click on the top right here, you can see on the sign in button, uh, that'll take you to this page where you can either sign in, or if you've forgotten your username or password, you can, it'll walk you through how to reaccess that. Or if you've never registered before, you can get started and set up your account um, there. Now, we are here to help you. If you have any issues, please let us know. Once you're inside the portal, you're going to notice on the left here that there are is the uh, documents. So if you click that tab, then you can go in and access all your documents, like I say, your monthly statements or your tax slips, whatever it may be. Um, you can set up your filter, your search by year. So you're going to want to select here, for example, your tax slips, your year end reporting. You want to kind of just all your accounts. So you get RSP deposits as well as your non-registered slips um, and make sure you're on the correct year obviously for this year for 20 for 2023 uh tax year uh the mobile app this is what it looks like if you go onto your app store whether you have a an iphone or a samsung an android or an apple product uh it's available on both so you can go into the app store go to the ia private wealth and download the mobile app and then you'll be able to log in with your same credentials and access all of your information um, on your account your holdings your your different accounts your performance all your documents as well. So again, this is a very useful tool. Um, My CRA account. Again, this is very useful. So if you go to the My CRA, Google My CRA, and, and either log into your account or set it up. 
Uh, if you are logging into your account, a lot of the times it's, it uh, logs in through your banking. So if you've got online banking, it can kind of link there and it'll be the same password and, and then make it a little easier to sign in so that you don't have multiple usernames and passwords. It's, it's the way I do it. Once you're inside there, you'll be able to click very you know obvious, your tax information slips, T4s and more. Wow, right? Pretty entertaining stuff. So once you're in there, again, you just select your, your year, 2023. I would do all slips. You want everything, you might as well. And then you can download them, open them as a PDF, save them as a digital copy, and that can be uh, sent to your accountant to do your taxes. Or you can um, do them, uh, or if you're doing them yourself, you can kind of download it there and it's all available for you. So here's the thing that I just kind of want to go through. Just uh, There's a little couple differences on some of the slips, depending on how you're receiving them. So how will I receive my documents? So mutual fund T-slips. So third-party investment, we invest your money. Sometimes we're using mutual funds or other inv investments through third-party companies. We do not send you those slips. They come directly from the, the mutual fund company. So we do not have access to those. So those will not be on the portal because they're not coming from us. They will come directly from them and they will be mailed to you. Now, these are still available on my CRA. So you can still get them all. Remember, CRA has all your information, all the T-slips from everybody, whether it's your employer or your investments. So those will be, those will be mailed out. Um, if you've selected to receive everything um, digitally, so, you know, from us, now we're going back to us, not third party, digitally, everything will only be available online and you will not get them mailed to you. But if you selected to still get physical mail, the slips will be mailed to you from us, uh, as well as be available still online. It's always available, available online. So if you haven't received anything from us, um, you may want to check your preferences or maybe it's just online and you've selected to receive it all digitally and that's why you haven't received anything in the mail. Um, covered the client portal and, uh, and the CRA app. And so basically, just kind of wanting to go through uh, the summary and the recommendation. So we will provide you with all of your T-slips that come from us for your stocks and your ETFs. We will provide you uh, with your gain loss report, your fee report, and your foreign property report. Uh, these will be mailed to you physically for everybody, even if you're digital only, as well as available online. These ones are mailed to you physically and available online because CRA does not have copies of these. These are not T-slips. These are additional uh, information to help you uh, with filing your return um, when you're having to maybe uh, report an adjusted cost base on your gain loss report. The mutual fund company will mail you all your T-slips for any mutual fund investments. Uh, again, we do not have copies of these. They do not come from us. They come from them. Uh, the client online portal and app has everything that we send you, right? Everything we have access to is available on the app. So you can access it there. The CRA app or portal has everything all together except for, which comes from us, the foreign property report, the fee report, um, and the gain loss report. So how do we put this all together? I said, I'm gonna give you the answer at the end. And these are my recommendations. So I know I went through a bunch of slides and maybe it's seeming overwhelming or confusing, but this is all you really need to know and do and the way I do my taxes. Have your accountant or your tax program import all of your tax slips from CRA. Now, if your accountant wants paper, I don't know what to tell you. I'd, I'd be looking for a different accountant um, or telling them to access to kind of go down that road and start accessing things through CRA. You will have to give them permission. It's one quick, easy form. It's done, I would say, most 90 plus percent of accounts, I assume, do it all this way anyways, but this is the easiest way. So step one, have your accountant or your tax program import everything from CRA. That'll get all of your T-slips, whether they're from us or from a mutual fund company. Then, additional to the CRA, all you need to do is provide your accountant with your gain loss report, your investment fee report, so you can deduct your management fees, and your foreign property report. These are the three reports that you will need in addition to what's on the CRA, uh, my CRA. 
These three reports, to remind you, are available on the app and they will be mailed to you or on our, on, on our portal. So digitally and physical, you will get copies of these. Last tip, to make sure your accountant is deducting your management fees on your non-registered account. Do not file too early. Do not file before April 15th as slips can trickle in or you know, just because they're late in the mail, it, they're also gonna be late getting posted up to, uh, to your CRA portal as well. And once all said and done, please review your tax return to ensure that everything looks correct and you're not, uh, there wasn't a mistake made by your accountant or something wasn't missed. Um, if you have any big surprises, oh, I owe $10,000 this year, that doesn't seem right. Review your tax return um, and review once it's all done and you signed off and filed it, great. Also review your notice of assessment. When you get it back, make sure you review that as well to make sure it again makes sense that what they, uh, you know, they, the refund they're providing, whatever it may be, is in line with what you expected. Um, you know, I always joke when I go out for dinner with my family, I review every item on that bill and maybe it's only a hundred dollar dinner or something like that. Um, so all of our tax bills are the biggest bills we pay every year. You're going to want to review that. You're going to want to make sure it's accurate. So hopefully that kind of makes things a little easier for you um, and a little less stressful when it comes to tax time. And if not, the other way CRA likes, it, uh, likes you to file is just fill this in. Basically, how much money did you make in 2023? Just send them that and then you should be good. I'm obviously joking. Do not do that. Um, with that, we kind of wrap it up here. We're, we're just a couple minutes over, but I hope uh, everyone found it really useful. If anyone has any questions or needs any help at any time, that's why we have our large team. We're here to help. We're here to support you during uh, tax time or answer any investment questions or any financial retirement planning questions. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. We're, uh, we're, always, uh, we're always available. Doesn't look like we have any major questions kind of coming through. Okay, we got a couple coming in here. Yeah, good point from Evelyn. Yes, your TFSA uh, deposits and withdrawals, they are always reported on CRA, but they are embarrassingly late. They are usually, the like for 2023, they're not reported at all. And they won't be usually until the spring. So if your room is saying you have $6,500 of room for your TFSA today it, and you made a contribution at any point last year, it just hasn't been reported and recorded and updated yet. So you always kind of have to keep your own TFSA contribution and, and withdrawal record, um, you know, within the last kind of 24 months to make sure it all kind of adds up and makes sense. Um, that seems like most of our questions. Gentlemen, anything that you'd like to add? No. No? I don't think okay. so. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, if you need anything, please let us know. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.